uh, then the com once this happens, the company can issue currency and use the currency to purchase foreign currencies and use those foreign currencies to buy land in the country that issues the currency. So if there's, a, if there's, a, if there's an exchange rate between social solutions tokens and, and dollars, then the company can issue social solutions tokens out of thin air, use that to buy dollars, and then use those dollars to purchase land in the United States. If it was, uh, if it was uh, rubles, they could issue kind of social solutions tokens, change it for rubles, buy land in Russia, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and yes, since the company can issue an unlimited amount of this currency, this expansion process could be incredibly rapid and incredibly dramatic. Um, it's, it's really just limited by the transaction rate you can achieve, and also, also the extent to which we're confident that we can, uh, we can create value. Because if the value of the land goes up, it works. If we don't know what we're doing and we start paying basic income and it goes down because we got the wrong mix of people, then it doesn't work. But if, if the company was really confident in its uh, that it that it really had it that that it really had it sort of nailed on how to like increase land value or social capital, you could inc you could dramatically uh, you could expand very rapidly. Within a few decades, it may be possible to redistribute most of the world's land rents out as a global basic income. So yeah, if 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 this if this is how we do things. Um, or on un company land, and company land expands to cover the world, you could potentially have something pretty close to a global basic income pretty quickly. Um, optional addition, infinite wealth card. Um, I'm going to say optional addition. I've, there's been several <laughs> criticisms of infinite wealth cards. It's actually not necessary. It's not necessary for this business to work. We don't need infinite wealth cards, uh, but it could be done. Um, to incentivize initial investors, and secure the support of key individuals who can help the companies navigate through the complex political, legal, and financial systems of all the different countries of the world. It might, not necessarily, but it might make sense to strategically issue infinite wealth cards. An infinite wealth card would, under some circumstances, enable the bearer to issue an inexhaustible sum of company currency for the purpose of purchasing goods and services which are priced in company currency. Infinite wealth cards could also be used to incentivize the leaders of nations to cooperate on a global level. Uh, I'm going to deal with that later. Uh, not declare war on each other and comply with international law. Uh, the details. Um, here, here's just a few questions you might ask. Here, like, you know, this is, I've given you the broad picture. There's, there's a lot of details to, to like, that might be, for which research might be desirable. What's the optimal mix of personality types to increase real estate value most rapidly? Hmm. Are there analogous seers of different types of people, analogous to ecological succession? Where you know, kind of different types of people. First, people go into the empty land, then some more people follow, then some more. Kind of like the way a you know, a, a, a sort of a lake turns to swamp, turns to grassland, turns to forest, that kind of thing. Um, uh, so, can can you uh, overcapitalize a community? Is giving people too much money make them lazy or something like that? Um, uh, what is the optimal uh, What is the optimal income to pay to optimize well-being? And if there is no optimum, if there's no maximum. At what point does well-being returns start to plateau out? So even if even if more income always creates more well-being, at what point does it sort of go uh, like that <laughs> and without going forever? Um, yeah. Uh, what is the optimal interest rate to give people access to capital without promoting waste? What is the optimal mix of income um, which produces maximum benefit, minimum cost? How can optimal cultures be replicated? Um, what uh, what uh, cultures? Are most conducive to criminal reform and treating addicts? Which cultures are highest quality of life for various disabilities, mental illnesses? Um, how easy is it to tailor a variety of communities to accommodate? So there's loads and loads of questions to ask um, to, and to research into. Um, it's, 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 a, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult business plan, but there's a lot of uh, gain in the end. It will take a large amount of research to answer these questions, but we don't have to perfectly understand the detailed processes involved in generating social capital. We just need to understand them uh, understand enough to make the business profitable. Uh, so yeah, mm -hmm. all we need to do is be able to find some way, some niche application where you can attract uh, people with a sum of money uh, paid out in whatever way mm -hmm. onto a location in, in such a way as to boost the real estate values faster than the rate at which you're paying them out. That's, that's all we have to find. One, once we find one particular circumstance where that's possible, then you've got a profitable business. Um, once social solutions find some profitable application, yeah, once it becomes profitable, then you can reinvest that profit into researching and expanding into other ideas. Um, government contracts. With respect to tailoring communities to be optimal for reducing criminal recidivism, treating drug addictions, and creating environments where people with disabilities and the infirm can thrive, it's unlikely this could be profitably done without government subsidies. Um, however, 
Um, while government payments are probably required for socially worthy causes, it's, it's also possible that through tailoring communities appropriately, um, more social benefit can be generated with less fiscal t cost. So the government, you, you probably, to, to accept kind of, to tailor communities to, to, to properly make money out of treating disabilities and stuff like that, you probably do need some kind of government transfer, but, but, hope, but it's still possible that, us, that uh, we could, that the, we could, through tailoring communities, you could actually use a given drug government transfer to generate well-being more efficiently than, um, than if, uh, than if uh, the government just paid in our existing societies. Um, it's, it's just one idea. Um, why this business plan is a panacea for most of humanity's problems? Uh, reducing disease and promoting health. Uh, people usually don't want to be ill. While there are many cheap projects for malaria nets, clean water, um, when people, uh, et cetera, et cetera, when people have money, they buy these things anyway. Like no, nobody, nobody wants to get malaria, so if they can afford to sort of take costs to stop, take take measures to stop it, um, so so all these kind of all these kind of low hanging fruit to deal with diseases uh, can also be got by just giving people money, because um, people will use the money to, to do it mostly. Uh, many basic income pilot studies, um, th this is like Indian one for example, many ba basic income pilot studies show across the board improvements in physical and mental health. Community income, which I'm talking about here, should have a similar effect. Um, since health will be a positive effect on location value, it makes sense to foster communities that promote it. Possibly, instead of spending all of the rent as community income, some payment in kind might be spent on, on health services, for example, as well, uh, such as clean water. Uh, social capital, crime, and mental health. Uh, good neighbours, high high levels of health, well adjusted people are also also contribute to raising location value. When it comes to charitable giving, it's incredibly important to prioritise the utility of each possible expenditure. However, uh, when when a plan when a plan funds itself, such as through real estate appreciation, there's more money available to address a, a wide range of social uh, uh, malaise uh, ills and uh, you know pretty much every social ill you can think of. Um, uh, by dealing with it, you can raise real estate value. So, um, so to a certain extent, dealing, improving the sort of improving the quality of life of people in an area will raise the value of the area. So, sort of a, a, across the board, we're going to want to improve the quality of life, and it should hopefully fund itself. Knock on wood. <laughs> um, yes, this is the biggest one actually. Um, reliable credit. Recessions and lost deposits. So, so the way recessions happen is that if the debt default exceeds interest payments for a wide variety of banks, then people lose their bank deposits. Um, well, it, it, well, it, initially the sort of the debt defaults sort of eat into the capital buffer of the bank, and when it runs through the capital buffer, then people lose their bank deposits. Uh, when people don't have deposits, they don't have to spend in the economy. Um, so there's there's less money in the economy. Um, and then, and then you know, they don't have deposits, they can't raise as much money for houses, and, uh, and also they just spend less money on goods and services. If less money gets spent on goods and services, then all the indebted businesses who are relying on income from people buying their goods and services... Um, struggle to pay their debts. Yeah, struggle to pay their debts. And, and how, do they, how, do they, how do they deal with uh, paying their debts? Well, they, they lay off some of their workers so that they can, uh, so that they can reduce their costs. The but now the workers don't have any wages either. Um, so you've got lots of individuals who lose their wages, and worst of all, the loss of wages corresponds to a massive asset devaluation. Uh, you know, because you know, when people don't have wages, they don't have money to buy assets. So, so they lose their wages coincides with uh, a house price crash. So now you've got all these people who who can't pay their mortgages, and when the bank seizes their house and tries to sell it, now uh, the the, when the bank sees their, their house and tries to sell it, the money, the proceeds of the sale don't cover the debt, so they, they so you get even more debt defaults. Uh, so that, so they lose money on, on even even using the, the the value of the capital asset, the house, doesn't cover the debt that they owe. So the bank loses even more money, causing more deposits. That's how a recession works. Um, there's a second less dramatic version of a recession, um, and that is the bank the bank doesn't actually get to the point where it runs out of deposits. But it sort of, but it starts to make a loss, and it's like yikes! You know, we're not uh, the debt defaults are exceeding our interest, uh, our interest uh, revenues. We've got to raise interest because you know we got we got to raise interest rates so that uh, 
so that uh, we can boost our interest receipts and, uh, and, and get them to cover the default rate. But of course, if you raise interest rates, people take out less loans. If people take out less loans, they're spending less on the economy, they're taking out less mortgages. Um, so again, you get the same thing, even without the, even without the lost of bullets, you still get the same thing where the house prices go down because people can't get loans as easily, uh, as easily for mortgages. And also, there's, you know, because they, they can't get loans to buy consumer services, people get laid off work. Um, this causes lots of indebted individuals losing wages during the house price crash, which again causes more defaults, which causes the banks to raise interest rates higher to stop that. So, so this is another vicious cycle uh, of how, how recessions happen. Reliable credit. Ending recessions forever. Recessions are either caused when, a debt, when debt defaults exceed interest payments, or when bank, banks hike interest rates and reduce lending due to the fear of debt defaults. <clears throat> in most cases, credit dries up in a vicious cycle, which causes yet more credit to dry up. But unlike other banks, Social Solutions Bank can remain solvent even if debt defaults exceed interest payments. And here's an interesting thing as well. It's the company's ability to inexhaustibly issue company currency will enable it to handle any run of the bank and pay out deposit in full. I said this already. Uh, furthermore, a run of the bank would not even dry up credit as the company bank can issue loans in company currency in the absence of any depositors at all. The company can issue loans out of thin air anyway, so even if there's no deposits in the company bank, if people want a loan, they can issue a loan. Uh, so, so, there's, there's the company will, so not only will the company never default on deposits, it will also never have to dry up any credit. It will also that basically what governments did in the financial crash there. They just printed money, like quantitative easing. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, but one, one thing is the the land rent thing is, is, is attached to the thing. The government, the, there's not really. I, I think. Yeah, I think. I think this is. Uh, I, I think this is just a more orderly version of that. Right. Mm. The, the, you know, the, the whole. The, the, uh, it's sort of a lot of this stuff with. Um, uh, yeah, because I think the problem is the private banks hold the deposits, so kind of. It's okay, so and this system can react a lot quicker as well. Right? Yes, it's, it, I think it's much more robust. I mean, it, broadly speaking, that's kind of what happened. That, and, and we do need central banks to do exactly that. But it's, uh, I, I think the existing with the central bank and the private bank and the deposits, it's a much more lumber, lumbering system yes. than, than what, I'm, what I'm proposing here. Uh, permanent economic growth. Stocks are still likely to get overvalued and crash from time to time. But without credit contractions, real GDP will never go down again. So yeah. Presumably the stocks are going to go. Oh yeah, yeah, this is great. And then oh, we've overvalued a bit. So you'll have, you'll still have stock price sort of crashes and stuff like that. But uh, but GDP, the actual real GDP in the economy, is caused by contractions of credit. Like stock, you know, stocks. Investors can get excited. They can get scared. But you know, it doesn't really make that much difference to the real economy if uh, if if credit doesn't dry up. Uh, that the credit that banks are giving real people to buy real services and run real businesses. Instead, prosperous people working together in trusting relationships will find ever better ways to organize their society. Reliable income begets reliable credit. If you ask a bank manager for a mortgage, he will not only be interested in your income, but also in the reliability of that income. If you've got a three-month contract, the bank's going to be a lot less likely to offer you a mortgage or, or a big loan um, compared to if you've got like a really steady job that's, that's good for years and years and years. Um, so the bank wants to know how reliable your income is, and not just and not just whether you whether you have an income at the moment. A given reliable income may be able to raise a larger loan at lower interest than even a larger income that is unreliable. Thus, reliability in increases an income's credit efficiency. So, uh, so how you pay money out is as important as paying as the quantity of money paid out. So if you pay money out in stocks and starts that money will produce less credit for the person who receives the income compared to if you pay money out in a really reliable way. Today, means-tested benefits are precarious and worse still, uh, are, are precarious, and worse still, the income from the labor, uh, from labor is becoming more precarious. So, so, so this is a book by Guy Standing called The Precariat, where he says that not only is, not only is the um, benefits we're giving out to people precarious, because, you know, well, do you qualify? Don't you qualify? Oh, the policies changed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Not only are the benefits precarious, but people's income they get from their day jobs is becoming increasingly precarious. More and more people are working in you know short contract, short-term contracts rather than long-term jobs. Um, and what I'm, I'm I'm arguing here is actually our increasingly precarious income 
has the net effect of destroying wealth and trust across society. So precarious income will require higher interest rates, and therefore you won't be able to raise as much credit with precarious income. And it's actually the ability to raise credit is the ability to it, it has, plays a very important role in, in allocating capital where it's needed. And if that and if if, uh, if people charge higher interest rates, that 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 ability kind of goes down and actually has a wealth destroying effect throughout society. And and that's what's happening right now, I think. The community income from redistributed land rents paid out uh, by the company will be instrumental in reducing debt defaults, promoting trust, and raising overall levels of prosperity. So um, not only can the company bank, um, not only can the company bank handle uh, defaults on debt um, because you know it doesn't need to be making a profit all the time, uh, but also it will um, it will uh, the, the community income will probably mean there'll be less defaults in debt in the first place. Um, full employment. Uh, structural unemployment. Structural unemployment is a major source of financial stress for those who find themselves unemployed. It's very stressful to be unemployed, um, especially if you've got if you're in the red and, and uh, have to make payments and loans and stuff like that. Uh, structural unemployment also increases levels of crime and illness. Uh, yeah, um, it is generally agreed that some level of structural unemployment is necessary to buffer the workforce. So, so most economists believe that we need a few unemployed people around. So that when an entrepreneur wants to hire people, that there's kind of a stock of labour for them to hire. Mm. Um, but given how much suffering that the structural employment can cause to those who are unemployed, is there another way? Could we achieve effective full employment and simultaneously create a single workers available for employers? Henry George's Law of Wages. Um, this is a, this is a, a, the Law of Wages is something that Henry George articulated back in 1879, um, and I'm going to quote here: "What." In the conditions of freedom will be the terms at which one man can hire others to work for him. Evidently, they will be fixed by what the men could make if laboring for themselves. So how much would a, a, an employer have to pay someone? It depends how much they can make if they don't have a job. Um, the principle which will prevent them from having to give anything above this, except what is necessary to induce the change, will also prevent them from taking anything less. Did they demand more? The competition from others would prevent them from getting employment. Did he offer less? None would accept the terms, as they could obtain greater results by working for themselves. Um, yeah. So wealth, wealth must either be bought or it must be made. Uh, we can think of wealth as that which is required in life for one to survive and thrive. You know, food is a form of wealth. Um, Theatre is a form of wealth. Some of the stuff we need, some of the stuff we want. But but to act, uh, be, uh, above a certain level of wealth, we're happy. Below a certain level of wealth, we're dead. Um, we can think of productivity as the amount of wealth that a given person produces per unit time. Remember the equation. Productivity per person equals time working, uh, well, equals function of time working times the function of capital. One can see that if one has access to zero or very little capital, productivity falls to zero or a very low value regardless of how much one, one works. Mm -hmm. so, so essentially, what people... That, that, that the amount that people can um, make by laboring for themselves very much depends on the amount of capital they can access. Mm -hmm. So we're not re so this whole idea of like we need jobs, we don't actually need to produce jobs. What we need is for people to have access to capital. Um, for people to be productive, they need to be able to access capital. Um, how do the initial people have access to capital? Community income. Well, they have access to money, but that money needs to buy capital, right? And there's no businesses there or anything else. Oh, uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, essentially, uh, I mean, you, you have to bring in a seed of capital. See, see labor multiplies the value of capital. So, right. so, so if, you, if you have a seed, of, it's like, it's like, a, it's, it's like um, you can't grow a plant from soil alone. I think so. So you can, you can grow a plant from a seed... Um, and then that plant can produce more seeds, yeah. which can produce more plants. So once you have that seed of capital, you can you can amplify the the seed with labor, but uh, but uh, you need that critical seed of capital, and then labor can amplify that further, and then you can export yeah. you can export capital, and then and then you can bring in more capital, and then you can add more capital, right. and you can amplify the capital. With, so 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 labor multiplies capital, and then I guess consumption yeah, kind of doubles it up. I, I don't think. Social capital is more like water for the seed, right? You have a business that's a seed, and it's, you have people that can water the, the business, 
and that business can grow, and then like, oh, there's like things around, and people need to work in the business, and then other businesses need to come around to support those people and support that business. But if you just have the people, I mean, and you don't have any, you don't have any anywhere for them to work or anything for them to work on. Democracy, yeah. Yes. I mean, they will have basic infrastructure, right? They have internet. Yeah, I mean, they can order. They can get. They're going to have. But, but the thing, the, the capital, the initial capital comes from investors. Remember, we're, we're kind of right. we're we're, yeah, we're no, raising we're, we're raising we're raising money in the national current we're raising money in the national currency from investment to pay community income in the yeah. national currency to people who live on the land after buying the land. So the initial seed of capital will will come from investors, um, and then and then uh, and and then that that's that. that that seed will be used to pay community income to people, and then people will be able to uh, use their community income to buy capital and infrastructure and stuff like that in the community, and then they will be able to work on that capital and amplify its value. Mm -hmm. So basically, you buy right. a bunch of yeah. property in the Bronx. Wait, uh, so you're not just paying them enough capital for them to live on. You need to pay enough to have them to live on, plus about enough for them to start businesses and stuff on top of that. Um, I mean, you know, what, what is what is living? I mean, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, uh, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs entrepreneurs can actually live very frugally if they're if they're if they're kind of if they're ambitious enough. Entrepreneurs can live incredibly frugally if they if they kind of if they have faith in the future. So it's quite possible that you know some people would would uh, some of the people who receive the community income would use the community income to to farm or, or something like that or. Or, or, or just, or just. Uh, and presumably, right. the initial investors providing yeah. the capital, they would also provide capital to budding entrepreneurs who are living on the land. Well, I, well, I would or actually go as far. Well, I would actually go as far as to say is that uh, no, we provide community income to everyone. But the thing is, with yeah. the filter function, the filter function is going to be important. We're, we're going to need to bring entrepreneurs in, or it's not going to raise, it's not going to raise real estate values. Yeah, so, yeah just one example for you. So you buy a bunch of property in the Bronx. You bring a lot of like you gentrify, gentrify the, the, the. I'm thinking more in the middle of nowhere, but right. So yeah, that's, I mean, it's, that's uh, the yeah. issue I have is like yeah, yeah. The way that this the way that this typically works yeah is that uh, like I've lived in a few cities that have sort of gone through this cycle and have yeah. crazy high property prices because oh, that's of this. Thing, yeah. And it's not just the social capital; it's the interaction of the social capital with the businesses that come and exploit that. And there's like and there's this like. There's this reinforcing cycle where there's a tipping point where there's enough businesses and there's enough people where more people want to come and more businesses want to come. But if you just have people, like if I'm an entrepreneur and I want to build a taco truck, yeah, I want to go to a place where I where first of all there's other infrastructure around.